Excellent. So the next part of our session, we are moving on to speaking with Daniel Coombson and Asim Badsha from Question Pro, who will be talking about surveys in the metaverse. So we actually are really getting real here now. And the results, and they're going to be talking about the results of a cross-sectional study they've conducted in the UK, um, exploring the awareness of the metaverse, willingness to participate in surveys, and much more. So I would like to welcome you both on stage. All right, thanks for having us. Lots of uh, fun topics here today. Lots of money being spent in the metaverse. Lots of hype, lots of headlines. And uh, what we do at Question Pro is surveys. So we decided to run a survey and see what's actually going on in the metaverse uh, and try to tie that back to, to real research. And I think we're kind of taking a little bit of a quant lens here and saying, okay, can we run quant in the metaverse? Can we do surveys in the metaverse? And uh, we'll see what the data kind of tells us and, and some of the bridges to maybe get there along the way as this thing evolves. Um, so again, my name is Asim. I'm the Managing Director for Question Pro UK. We do survey software. You'll kind of see how we ran the survey at, a, at an in-depth level. Uh, we've seen some of this data already today, and it kind of com com compares and, and validates the data that we saw. So that's good to see. And. Um, as a kind of an agenda, we'll start with study objectives. Um, we'll talk, I think, a lot about adoption, right? Really, who's in the metaverse today? Um, what are the types of research that you can actually run in the metaverse today? Talk about some of the risks, and then really a roadmap. Where are we going, and how are we gonna get there? So let's jump into the study objectives first, and I'll pass it on to Daniel. Great, thank you, Asim. So, um, as we have already heard, I mean, there's a lot of studies already going on, and Ipsos, um, YouGov, Statista, there's a lot of statistics around it. There's a lot of studies that have been done already around this, people exploring. And there are four key things, really, like I see Mas already mentioned. Awareness today, um, adoption today, and in the future, user experiences today and in the future, and the big issue around identity and, and that, how that links to trust and how we can trust our data. If the data is not good, if it's not real, then we, we might as well not be there at all. So we just did um, a short um, survey, straightforward, quite targeted, a bit different from what others have done, just looking at people that have already been there. So kind of screening out all the people that have no idea, have not been there, and then looking at the people that have been there and what the experiences are like. So it's a bit more focused approach. So, um, we looked at, we just took an example of 800 people, um, tried to split it male, female, um, did a bit of uh, data quality screening there around gibberish and things like that, asking people instead of, um, to, to give us their user experiences, what they are doing in there and what they would like to do in the future, what they would like to spend their money on. So some of the um, presentations that I've gone ahead, I've spoken, I touched on that already. An interesting thing here to note just before I move on is the percentage of smartphones that got involved in this study. So that just confirms the, that principle of, you know, mobile first here when we are doing service, a lot of people are using mobile phones now. So it's always important to make sure that our service are mobile friendly and the user experience they are, it's, it's great. Okay, so let's jump into it, adoption. So I, I like the fact that um, the, the, the theme of the, of, the, of the conference is a reality check. And I think when we talk of reality, it's, it's whose reality, right? And is reality relative? So I think uh, uh, there was uh, one of the presentations, I think mentioned that when they measured awareness about one in two people, and that was great. So uh, kind of a bit similar, but we think um, maybe not as great as we would have expected it to be. So, right, the, the general awareness is, is not as widespread as we would have expected it to be, considering the bars around it. So, you know, it depends on where you look at it. For me, in my generation and how I see, I would expected much more people to be aware of it than it is there. So, that is, that is the reality that uh, we have here. And then the, the second thing is around um, adoption. So, if we just do a quick poll here, how many of us have been in the metaverse? 
Yeah, okay, so about, about a third of us, right? And uh, so we screened out everyone that said they have no idea what the metaverse is and went ahead with people that, that know what it is and asked them whether they've been in there uh, b before and then took them ahead. And just 17% uh, of people, uh, of, of, of the general population in the UK have actually you know, been in the metaverse before. And that is not... Again, what, I would have expected something a little bit higher than that. And again, I think it also depends on what people actually think the metaverse is, because most people are not really sure what the definition is, AR, um, VR, um, mixed reality, and whatever term you choose, to, you choose to call it. And again, we also think that there are, I think it was Richard that um, spoke about or asked the question around um, barriers. And we do think there are, um, the, the barriers are quite high. So during the, the break, I was having a discussion with someone who was asking me about um, whether, like, I think someone asked about whether it's for big brands, and I think it, it does seem to be the case. My answer to that was, I don't think the barrier is about the cost. I think the barrier, the key barrier is about risk appetite and how curious um, organi organizations are. Right, so we have Mark Zuckerberg now putting all his bags, uh, eggs in this in this one basket, and because he really believes in it, right? So I, I think that is what it is. But first, we've got to deal with the problem of awareness in the first place, and adoption, and how what risks people are willing to take, and of course the cost. I mean, the the Met Meta's um, Google, I, sorry, Google, now cost I think. Um, $1,500 or so. So how many people can actually afford that? So we do have some, you know, high um, barriers there to, to adoption. So just before I hand back to Asim to take us a bit deeply into the specifics of who is there, what are their sex, um, what are their, 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 their age ranges, and what are they doing there in general. So for all the people that entered or attempted our survey, just about 10%. So you, we can safely say that just about 10% of the general population have actually been in the metaverse before. So who are these people? What are they doing? And how can we leverage that um, as, as researchers? I'll hand back to Asim. Yeah, absolutely. So it's good to see kind of in the room, right? It's about 30% of people, 25% of people raised their hands saying that they were in the metaverse. I think what we found was that it's actually a lot less, um, you know, about one in 10. And obviously this room is going to be a little bit biased. Maybe we're a little bit more in terms of, you know, technology adopters. But I think this is the major challenge that we have to face as researchers today, right, is that there's actually just not that many people who have even been in the metaverse uh, that can take part of these studies um, if we are going to be running them in the metaverse. So I think with that number, it kind of rules out, you know, real quant, nationally representative studies in the metaverse. Obviously, you can't do that with 10% of the people in the metaverse. Um, but we can start to look at different groups and kind of who is actually in the metaverse as part of these 10%. And that might guide us a little bit to what are the studies that we can run in the metaverse or who should we be running them with if we are going to be doing studies in the metaverse. So. We've seen some of this data before, and I think it, it kind of validates some of the presentations that have been ahead of this, is that you know, when you look at who's been in the metaverse across gender and age, well, no surprises there. We kind of lean towards people who, who identify themselves as male, uh, and we lean towards younger age groups. Um, and so this is where you can now start to use this as a researcher to kind of identify where could your studies potentially be. If your audiences are younger males, um, then maybe you can actually start to do some research in the metaverse today. Uh, if it's not, then you may have to wait, um, and, and you may just not find enough people there to actually do these studies. Obviously, we've kind of said, listen, that rep is out. You know, real quant might be out at this point, but We've seen some of these types of studies that you can do for, from a qualitative perspective. And so if your audience is there, you know, younger males, um, they've got devices already, that's where it might make sense to invest in some of these qualitative studies today uh, to really kind of get experiential, to have people feel spaces, be in spaces, interact with the things that you develop in the metaverse. But I think as researchers, we have to look at it through this lens. Who's actually there uh, to do the research in the first place? So this is kind of the current state. Let's talk about where it's going, right? We've, we've kind of heard that question. Okay, we're not ready today. 
when are we going to be ready? When are there going to be enough people in the metaverse for us to actually run studies across different groups, different demographics? Uh, so we kind of just asked the question, right? And, and we decided to kind of compare it to social media and, and asked, you know, considering the amount of time that you spend on social media, how many years do you expect before you're kind of spending that same amount of time in the metaverse, if at all? Uh, and what you'd see here is that about 50% of the respondents actually predict that they're going to be spending as much time in the metaverse as they do on social media within five years. So 2027 kind of becomes this first target where, okay, maybe we're getting to 50%. Maybe we're starting to get to some level of critical uh, adoption. And this now increases to 58% by 2032. So we continue to push that out 10 years, and we're getting to around 60%. Now, one thing to note is that this is a lot lower than some of the other numbers that are out there, right? As we kind of look at this, all the headlines about the metaverse and, and a bit of the echo chamber that's out there, you know, people are reporting that, hey, 74% are going to be in the metaverse by, you know, 2022 or even, even five, 10 years out. And what we're seeing is that that's just not the case. It's going to take more time. It's going to go a little bit slower than maybe the hype cycle is telling us today. So as researchers, and we want to be running you know, research in the metaverse, maybe wait a few years, you're going to get a little bit more critical adoption. But we are seeing that pretty big bar there at the bottom. 28% are just saying never, never going to be in the metaverse, right? Those groups, they're not going to take part in a study. They're not going to be there. So let's kind of zoom in on who that group is. What do they actually look like? And again, no surprises there you'll see the percentage of people that say never obviously skews up as we get older, but very interestingly, actually with females, kind of even younger groups are saying they're never gonna be in the metaverse. Um, so again, you are looking at some big age gaps and gender gaps to think about as you invest in research in the metaverse and think about what those studies might look like going forward. Now, one positive thing here, as researchers, we typically do reward our uh, participants to take part in research studies. And so we ask the question, um, you know, how comfortable would you be taking a study if you were paid and rewarded to do it in the metaverse? And this is the good news, right? People are like, yes, we're very comfortable. Pay me and I will do a study in the metaverse. Uh, only 4% actually said that they would be uncomfortable doing it. So this is good news, especially for those qualitative studies where you know it needs to be very experiential. You might have a bigger budget to get the right people in. Okay, people are willing to do it. They're willing to learn. But you as the researcher have to take that burden on, right? These people don't necessarily have the devices. Are you gonna ship them that device? Maybe there's a hybrid where we can use some of the Google Cardboard, but you're gonna have to teach people. You're gonna have to think about that bias, that. Maybe they don't truly know exactly how this space works and what they're doing in there. Um, so some positives here for sure, right? That, hey, we can pay people and people are willing to do research in the metaverse, but they may not be there today. And you may be spending a lot of time getting them the right equipment and, and ramping them up. So we've talked about one in 10 are there today. We've talked about kind of where it's going, that people can do research. So the question is kind of what is the type of research, right? We've talked about qualitative kind of being the thing that makes sense in, in the metaverse today. So we kind of asked people, you know, what are the types of activities that you actually engage in the metaverse? Gaming, no surprises there, right? Playing with things, interacting with things, touching, feeling, moving, those are the types of qualitative studies that make a lot of sense. Now, you'll also see some other pieces here, you know, friends, Facebook, communicating, exploring. That's kind of another aspect of, I think, qualitative studies in the metaverse. You know, can you run just focus groups in the metaverse? Does it make it more interactive to sit around a virtual table, see the emotions on people's faces virtually, to have those conversations go in depth and you know, do a virtual focus group. I think that definitely can apply in the metaverse as well. There's some risks there. Daniel will talk about that in a second, but I think these are kind of the two big categories of the types of experiences and qualitative research that you could be doing in the metaverse. The other question is, who are the companies that should be doing this research in the metaverse? 
Um, so we kind of asked, you know, what are the kinds of product services you'd want to be able to buy in the metaverse? And this again aligns with a lot of the spaces and brands and companies that we've been talking about all morning. Uh, retail companies, right? Packaging design, where you really want to see, touch, feel. Fashion, where you want to wear the virtual clothing before you actually develop it, get people's opinions on it. Uh, automotive, we've talked about. Tourism, taking people into virtual spaces. These are all of the types of things that I think really apply to research in the metaverse today, as long as that audience is there with the devices ready to go. Again, some groups might be today that you can do it, other groups might be a little bit of time, and you can speed it up by paying for it and shipping those devices to people. So that's kind of the current state. There are some risks, and Daniel, our research manager, is always thinking about fraud in surveys and research in general. So we'll talk a little bit about what that might look like in the metaverse as well. Okay. So, yeah, I like this one. It's, it's an important one for me. So we kind of asked two main questions around this one very quickly, whether people use their... Um, real names when they go into the metaverse. We are using these as, you know, proxies, you know, and whether their, their visual representation of themselves in the real world is the same in the metaverse. We've had, you know, we've, we've done some focus groups, online focus groups where people came in you know, from where we're expecting them to be and this caused some issues. So this is an important one and some surprise there actually. So interestingly, um, just about 11% said sometimes. So that is, that's, that, that is good. Um, and I think um, I saw a study from um, some two ladies from, I think, Disney that researched and found that actually much more young people, actually the age of the people, the age group that is actually in there, active there, 18 to 35, they actually want to use their real names and their real identity, which is, which is good news actually for us. But then we still have that 11% and that 9% on the visual side that introduces some level of, you know, uh, caution that we should have. So I think as researchers, we need to think about how sensitive if we're going to do surveys in the metaverse, how sensitive a study is to identity fraud. And I do think that we, we to respond to that, we need some new um, methods of analysis. And I was really glad to see what the, the presenter that just before us spoke about this new kind of um, um, methodology for analyzing data. I also think that if we're going to analyze such data and avoid that uh, risk of fraud, then perhaps we need to look at and maybe some methodologies that are not so common in market research now, like you know, exploratory factor analysis and things like that, that are not so mainstream. In in those are not they agnostic to identity, right? They are because there's a real person taking the survey, right? So we can use some other form of identification of them, and then our study will still will still be valid. So two things here: there is um, self identification in the metaverse may be sometimes inconsistent or real, and we need to bear that in mind. And number two, we need to consider how sensitive a study will be to identity fraud. And three, maybe leveraging some methods of analysis that are not so dependent on real life identity, looking more into their core self. Okay, I'll hand back to Asim. So Snoop Dogg showed up for your uh, research, your focus group on the metaverse, and you've got a 50% chance that it may not be Snoop Dogg. <laughs> Right? I think this is the challenge, right? I mean, with deep fakes and everything else, you know, 60, 61%, so yeah, they want to use the right, you know, visual representation of themselves, but that does mean that 40%, you have no idea who you're getting in that group. Um, may not matter, right? If it's a true experiential study and all you care about is how is somebody interacting with the product. But I think as researchers, we do care, right? Is it what age group are they in? What location are they in? What gender are they? Um, and obviously in the survey world, we do all sorts of things to try to fight that. I think that's the next uh, conference that ASC is going to have, right? Fraud detection. How do you do that? And I think maybe we haven't figured that out completely in the metaverse. Are you getting the right people? Are they actually who they say they are? So one thing to think about as we kind of go on this roadmap to the metaverse, this adoption curve, right? We kind of looked at the data five, ten years out. 
Well, there's also some things that we can be doing today that kind of combats the identity risk fraud um, and also creates really engaging experiences for people. Sometimes it might feel a little basic today, but it's video, right? If, if you kind of rewind two years ago before COVID and the pandemic, people weren't used to getting on video chats or doing a quick FaceTime or doing as much on video. Now people are used to it. Um, I think as researchers, we may not be taking advantage of that enough, right? And that's a really, really good way as kind of a half step. Everybody's got it on their phone, right? We saw the numbers at the beginning. Most people are taking these surveys on this on their phones, right? We're talking about augmented reality happening through the phone instead of waiting for somebody to actually get a device and put it on their face. So this is a lot of what we're thinking about at Question Pro as kind of that next step before we get to the metaverse is just how do you integrate more video, right? How do you put that in a, in a survey where they just click on the button and boom, they can record a 15 second of themselves talking, engaging with you or doing a virtual focus group on Zoom, interacting with things within the context of their mobile phone. I do think that's the first step that a lot of researchers can be thinking about today and can have a lot of the advantages of that interactivity that you get in the metaverse. Um, you know, for me personally, it's like, you know, it doesn't make sense to do a focus group in the metaverse versus doing it in video where you can actually see the real person on the other end. The interactive experiences, that you can't really get on video, right? This touching, feeling, interacting with the product. So those are the spaces where I think researchers should be very focused today uh, in terms of using the metaverse. And clearly, it's going to lean towards product services experiences that are more geared towards males and the younger groups. Um, but as we kind of go through this adoption cycle, five, ten years out, you may have more people there. Um, and if it makes sense, for a lot of these studies, it does, right? If you really want to test that car uh, before you actually build the prototype, it might make sense to pay, pay the money, ship out the devices, and get people using them to experience the interior of that car uh, and speed this thing along before we've got to wait for everybody to get devices. So a quick look at what the data looks like today, what the current adoption landscape is. Uh, hopefully that was helpful, and we'll take questions. <laughs> Uh, any questions for the Question Pro guys? Oh, and from here. I'm going to kill myself on this cable. <laughs> Thanks very much. That was really good, really engaging. Um, I have one on sampling. You talked about sampling there, and particularly in regards to inclusivity. Um, did the data show, or do you have any understanding of, whether we really are heading towards liberating everybody to experience new things and learn and engage with things, or are we just kind of reinforcing discrimination where the rich can access things and other people just can't? I think the data pretty clearly shows that the metaverse is not an inclusive place today, right? I mean, just there's so many demographics that aren't in the metaverse, and you saw the data that said there's certain demographics that are never going to be in the metaverse. Um, we think about that even with mobile today, right? When you run surveys, you know, if we're working with the NHS, we can't just say that the survey is going to be digital. You have to have a pen and pencil option, right, for people to kind of come back and, and people who don't necessarily have access to phones, technologies, or, or maybe they have access but they don't know how to use it. Or, you know, there's certain accessibility issues. These things have to kind of come and be involved. And I think that's why when we look at it today, True quant, fully accessible, I think is a very, very long way off. But if you are thinking more qual and experiential within certain demographics where it just matters less, then I think you know there, there are opportunities today. But I, I think it's going to be just like with mobile technology, right? It's like it, it's it's hard to be inclusive right from the beginning. Um, and even with surveys and on mobile devices, we still do a lot of work in terms of color blindness and, you know, are you able to kind of type or can you provide, you know, a, a verbal uh, answers to the questions? There's still a lot being done even in kind of these older technologies to bring in and make sure that we've got 100% representation of all of these groups. Question from Manning. Just wonder, did you ask your respondents what they thought the benefits of doing research in the metaverse would be compared to the real, real world? No, we didn't. That's the short answer. 
So the, the approach we took was to explore the themes that we wanted to explore. So we, we didn't ask that, but uh, definitely I hope that some, some of the, the presentations have already um, touched on it or will touch on it, yeah. Yeah, we took a little bit of the perspective that you know, they're not the researchers, and so they may not have the best answers for that. And I think we kind of instead asked, what are they doing today in the metaverse, right? What are the types of activities that they enjoy doing? And then we can kind of capture that and say, okay, this is how to apply it to research. I had three hands in the same place. I hope it's one question. <laughs> I'm away. <laughs> then it's... Hi, uh, my name's Sam, and I'm here with my two colleagues who work for Purdy Pasco, who are a medical market research firm. Uh, it's interesting because you mentioned that you've worked with the NHS, but on your word cloud, we didn't really see anything about medical market research, especially perhaps in the context of maybe clinical trials or... Um, medical device research as well. So are there any applications that you think that this could be applied to in, in that context? Yeah, I think, you know, I think the reason why we didn't see that come back in the data is because when people are in the metaverse themselves, they're not doing medical things um, from a consumer perspective, right? They're not kind of going into the metaverse and operating on themselves. But I think in the B2B environment, you see that a lot, right? Where surgeons are kind of practicing in the metaverse on, on you know, bodies and going through surgeries and things like that. Um, so from a consumer perspective, are those participants going to be ready to be in the metaverse? Again, the data is telling us that a lot of those groups that the healthcare industry cares about are not in the metaverse today. Uh, but the healthcare industry also can pay a lot for this research and can maybe take on the, um, the cost and the, the effort to ship out devices and train people on how to use them so that they can do more medical research in the, um, in the metaverse. Yeah, I just want to add quickly. So the, the first presentation also spoke about the, the, the basis of the metaverse of infrastructure and the computing space. So if, if, if it's not there, then people can use it. So it has to be built first and made user friendly and then accessible. So that, that is the fundamental. If it's there, then more people can be there and it can be used. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel and Asim. That was really insightful. I think what I've taken away from that is the adoption landscape to see that in the future, there is an increase in those that are willing to take and participate in surveys online, not online, in the metaverse. Um, and it just shows that where we've been talking about investment and where some companies already started to invest on their metaverse um, concepts and, and products, it might actually be really worth jumping on it now because in the next five years this could be expanding to something really huge so just a bit of food for thought there um talking about food it's lunchtime <laughs> so food is being served in the same places where you got your coffees from i think it's the presidential suite um, i'm sure we'll all smell our way to the food so we will reconvene in an hour so we'll see you back shortly and do take this opportunity to network and mingle